All right, hello and welcome to our first ever Sunstone 2020 Digital Symposium. I'm Lindsay Hansen Park, Executive Director of Sunstone, and it's my job to welcome you here today. So thanks for joining us on this Opening Smith Pettit Lecture. We want to recognize that during this time, there are many systems of oppression that are impacting many people in different ways in our community. There's a worldwide pandemic, the continual occupation of indigenous lands, particularly along the US-Mexico border, and the widespread racial injustice, Black Americans and those around the world who are suffering as, as a result of injustice, oppression, greed, and poverty. Our work is not done. So we'd like to acknowledge that intersection of those things that uniquely impacts each of us in different ways. And we'd like to ask you to take a moment of silence today, maybe say a prayer for, or donate money and energy to organizations and efforts that reduce the suffering of others. Put your optimistic faith in, human, in humanity into action and make a commitment to be mourn with many who are mourning. Uh, I want to first thank our conference organizers. We want to thank our conference organizers uh, Grace Poole, she is our director of events and she has done a phenomenal job organizing the event. Our publications directions editor, uh, Stephen Carter, and of course our volunteer, Trace Rogers, who has helped make this possible. Thank you for all our board members, donors, volunteers, and supporters. We absolutely could not do this without you. You were, in part, you were part of an important movement to help heal the wounds of our past and bring forth a new way to talk about hard issues of faith. The Sunstone Education Foundation started in 1974 as a magazine that published in Mormon experience, scholarship, issues, and art. Then in 1978, it branched out into symposia and regional conferences. Today, more than 45 years later, Sunstone Salt Lake Symposium draws together sometimes hundreds and even thousands of people to talk about Mormon identity, history, theology, politics, culture, and more. The attendees hail from all over the restoration spectrum. We also recognize that we have many non-Mormons attending today as well, and we appreciate you being able to interact with us peculiar Mormons. Um, because the symposium hosts such a diversity of thought and belief, it can be a challenge for attendees to interact with each other constructively, especially when people have strongly, deeply held opposing views. But this is exciting to me. This challenge is an opportunity for us. It's an opportunity to expand our minds and empathize with each other. As Joseph Smith put it, by proving contraries, truth is made manifest. To participate in Sunstone, you only need to have an interest in Mormonism and a willingness to engage respectfully, thoughtfully, and intelligently. And sometimes that can be challenging. Historian Steve Shields has estimated that there are at least 480 extant expressions of, of Mormon tradition or groups that came out of the original church that Joseph Smith restored. And that includes the most well-known group, the LDS group, which is the branch that I was born and raised in, known as the mainstream Mormon church or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So I recognize that, that this audience is diverse and individuals come from many different expressions of the restoration, but I hope you'll permit me to use a quote from one of the leaders in the LDS tradition in which I was brought up in. Our late president Thomas S. Monson said, let us have courage to defy the consensus, the courage to stand for principle, courage. Courage, not compromise, brings a smile of God's approval. Courage becomes a living and an attractive virtue when it is regarded not only as a willingness to die manfully, but as a determination to live decently. A moral coward is one who is afraid to do what he thinks is right because others will disapprove or laugh. Remember that all men have their fears, but those who face their fears with dignity have courage as well. As we kick off this conference tonight, I want you to engage these three full days of different topics, discussions, and themes starting tomorrow with courage. I ask that we approach the conference with the courage that Monson suggested, the courage to open your hearts and minds to new relationships, the courage to practice curiosity. That one can be so difficult, not by virtue of itself, but as an act of radical empathy, 
and one that disrupts the foundation over and over and over again that we might have of old harmful ideas that need to crumble away to make way for new ones to be built up. May we have the courage to overcome the preconceived judgments and stereotypes we learn, that we've learned and inherited over the years that keep us separated from the understanding of ourselves and from others. The courage to resist the lessons and narratives that keep us small, that keep our God small, and keep our love and heart from growth and expansion. I hope that we have the courage to claim space in this tradition that made and shaped you without fear of rejection or dogma. There are so many boundaries and limits in Mormonism. We're so practiced at that. We like to tell people who belongs and who doesn't, who is in, who is out, who believes this and who doesn't. And at the Sunstone Symposium, it's an invitation to belong. We want you to be part of something where you don't need to do anything, but just show up as you are and meet people as they are, where they're at in that moment in time. Whether you are ex-Mormon, atheist, believing Latter-day Saint, Community of Christ, Mormon fundamentalist, independent, or anything in between, we claim you at Sunstone as legitimate heirs to this tradition with legitimate claims to its legacy, its direction, and its community. As we begin this conference, may we each have the courage to claim ourselves and to claim others. Thank you. And now it's my great honor to turn the time over to our board member, Karen Peter. Karen Franklin Peter is the president of the Fifth Quorum of the Seventy for Community of Christ, which is a tradition that stayed in Nauvoo and most, mostly known as the RLDS tradition or Emma's Church. And Karen serves on the Council of Presidents of Seventy, and she'll be introducing our Smith Pettit lecturer today. So thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. And thank you for attending this 2020 Sunstone Digital Symposium. This is session 91, titled Bart Ehrman. The audio from this session is streaming live and will be available on Sunstone's Facebook page. You can also purchase audio from any session in the forthcoming conference by registering for this conference at sunstone.org. And I recommend that you register for the conference tonight if you haven't already done so. Registration helps support Sunstone, and you will have access to over 120 sessions of our conference, which will stay available for the next three months. The video recording of this session will be available in the Whova app for approximately three months, beginning at the end of August 2020. So a couple of instructions about the question and answer time at the end of our session. Please type your questions into the Whova app, all the questions that you would like uh, Dr. Ehrman to address after his lecture. At Sunstone, we are making it a goal to build a community that allows many ways for people to express their faith. Our tagline is, there's more than one way to Mormon. And we invite you to help us build a community where all paths are given space to be better understood. Please support us in our mission by making a donation and subscribing at sunstone.org. Now, about tonight's presentation. Each year, the Smith Pettit Foundation offers Sunstone a grant to open our symposium with a lecture from a non-Mormon guest. The idea is to bring new ideas and voices into our faith community. This session is sponsored by the Smith Pettit Foundation and is free and open to the public and is being broadcast on Facebook as well as through our digital event app. Again, to enter a question, you must be registered for the symposium and submit your question through the Whova app. A recent Pew Research poll showed that 72% of Americans believe in a literal heaven and 58% in a literal hell. Most people who hold these beliefs are Christian and assume that they are age old teachings of the Bible. But eternal rewards and punishments are found nowhere in the Old Testament and are not what Jesus or his disciples taught. Let's join 
Bart Ehrman as he unfolds the history of post-mortality, drawing from his latest book, Heaven and Hell, A History of the Afterlife. And then we'll participate together in a question and answer session following his lecture. Let me take a second to introduce you to our speaker before we begin. Bart D. Ehrman has written or edited 30 books, including five New York Times bestsellers, How Jesus Became God, Misquoting Jesus, God's Problem, Jesus Interrupted and Forged. Ehrman is a James A. Gray Distinguished Professor of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and is a leading authority on the New Testament and the history of early Christianity. His work has been featured in Time, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, and other print media. And he has made appearances on NBC's Dateline, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, CNN, The History Channel, National Geographic, The Discovery Channel, BBC, and major NPR shows, as well as other media outlets. So with that, let's give the floor to Professor Ehrman. Welcome. Professor, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, you're on. Okay. We've lost your screen. We've lost your screen share, though. I think. Uh, well, I've lost. Uh, I lost all of you, and uh, so let me try the screen sh share. Screen share again. We can. We can see. There we go. We can. There we go. We can okay. see you, yeah. and we can see your slide. Okay. Yep. Apologies. Thank you. Oh, kicked off for a while. I thought I was uh, entering into heaven, but made a brief, brief trip to hell. So, uh, right. Uh, thank you all for uh, for having me. I really appreciate it. This sounds like a uh, unusually impressive uh, conference you have, and I'm honored uh, to be asked to start uh, with this uh, with this uh, this lecture of mine on uh, the history of heaven and hell. Uh, I should begin by saying that this is a topic that has been uh, very important to me on a personal level for a uh, a very long time. Um, starting from when I was uh, very young. I believed in uh, heaven and hell. Uh, I was raised in the uh, Protestant tradition and uh, spent most of my young life as a Episcopalian. Uh, eventually I had a born again experience in high school and became a uh, committed evangelical uh, Christian. And then I really believed in heaven and hell <laughs> and was pretty sure uh, I wanted to go to heaven and thought I was and thought most people were not <laughs> and were going to hell. Uh, I, I eventually, for a number of reasons, ended up uh, moving away from my evangelical faith and then leaving uh, Christianity uh, altogether, so that now I consider myself uh, an atheist. But I'm still uh, a scholar of the Bible and extremely interested in everything having to do with the Bible and with early Christianity. Um, this talk, then, is, uh, is going to be focusing on one of the most important issues within every stream of Christianity, the history of heaven and hell, a history that most people, even those who are uh, devout, devout Christians, uh, don't, don't uh, really know very much about, uh, in my experience. Uh, so I've got a, I'm, I'm going to do a PowerPoint here. I've got slides. I'm, I'm starting off uh, appropriately with uh, Dante and uh, and Virgil, <laughs> uh, and uh, as you can see, they are in uh, they they are not in Paradiso here. <laughs> they are in the Inferno. Uh, so uh, I will not be going up as far as Dante. My my focus of interest is on the first four Christian centuries, when uh, Christians developed the views that became traditional throughout Christianity, down through the Middle Ages, into modernity, about the idea that when a person dies, their soul goes to either heaven or hell. 
Um, and now, technical difficulty number two, there it is. Okay, here I start. I'm going to begin with a book that uh, is uh, well known among scholars, but not so well known among those who are not scholars. It's a book that almost made it into the New Testament, but eventually did not. Up until the fourth century, there were Christians who thought this should be in the Bible. It's a book that claims to be written by the Apostle Peter, uh, and it's an apocalypse, a revelation of what is going to happen. This book was discovered uh, by Serendipity in 1887 by a French archaeological team that was digging in a cemetery in Egypt and uncovered a tomb that happened to have a, uh, uh, a, uh, the remains of a human being in it, but also a book, a 66-page book that was a small anthology of texts. Uh, there were four uh, different texts in this and uh, in this book. Uh, one of which is the one we're going to focus on here, the Apocalypse of Peter. This is now our earliest surviving account of a guided tour of heaven and hell. We are familiar with the idea of a guided tour of heaven and hell from the writings of Dante, whom we just saw, but Dante didn't invent the idea. Uh, Dante, in fact, was picking up an old tradition that had been around in Christianity for a long time, that sometimes people have been given tours of uh, the realms of the blessed and the damned, and that's certainly what we get with the Apocalypse of Peter. This book was probably written in the second century of the Common Era, so say a hundred years after uh, Jesus had died. In it, Jesus allegedly gives Peter a tour of the heavenly realm and the, uh, the realms of hell. Uh, the, uh, it's an interesting account, in part because the vision of heaven is rather brief and frankly, somewhat uninteresting. Uh, in part because I think there's only so many ways you can describe eternal bliss. <laughs> the saints are happy in heaven. They are completely blessed and joyful forever and ever and in ecstasy, but what do you say? I mean, it's, you know, there they are. On the other hand, when Peter describes the torments of hell, uh, the allegedly Peter describes, when the author describes it, claiming to be Peter, he can let loose all of his creative juices, and he does so. Uh, if you have any imagination at all, you can come up with some amazing tortures for people, and that's exactly what this author does. It turns out that in hell, in this vision, people are punished according to their characteristic sin. And sometimes the punishment meets the crime. So for example, um, people who have blasphemed against God, lied against God with their tongue, are hanged by their tongues over eternal flames. Women who have braided their hair to make themselves attractive so they can seduce men are hanged by their hair over eternal flames. The men they seduced are hanged by a different body part over eternal flames. <laughs> the men cry out, we didn't know it would come to this, <laughs> which I'm sure is true. Uh, Peter sees a, uh, a large number of sinners, and they're all being punished according to their characteristic sin. Uh, and he also then, of course, sees the, uh, the realms of heaven, where the saints, the believers in Jesus who have done good deeds, reside forever. This is not a, uh, an overly long book. Uh, it makes for very interesting reading. You can still read it today in English translation uh, since it's, been, uh, since it's pub been published since the 19th century. It is not overly subtle uh, with respect to its overarching point. <laughs> the point is, if you want the blessings of heaven and you want to avoid the torments of hell, don't sin. Um, and there are very specific ways that it tells you, uh, tells you not to sin. This idea that when somebody dies, their soul goes to heaven and hell became the dominant view within Christianity. And I want to trace where those ideas came from of heaven and hell. Your body dies, your soul gets rewarded or punished. I want to talk about views now and views back in antiquity, now and then. Now, uh, as Karen just pointed out, there, uh, there is a widespread view still in America uh, that 
when a person dies, they go to heaven. Seven out of 10 people uh, continue to think that today. Uh, most of them Christian because mainly it's a Christian country, but a uh, variety. If you even, even you throw in the atheists and the agnostics, seven out of 10. Whereas six out of 10 continue to believe in a literal hell as a place of punishment for your soul if you, uh, if you are not among the righteous. The striking thing, as Karen pointed out, is that these views of heaven and hell are found nowhere in the Old Testament. The Old Testament says nothing about a person dying and their soul going off to be rewarded or punished. Even more striking, the historical Jesus also does not teach the idea of heaven and hell, the idea that your soul, when you die, your, your, your body dies, it ceases to exist, your soul goes to one place or the other for reward or punishment forever. If that's the case, if it's not the teaching of Jesus, and it's not what was found in the Old Testament, where do these ideas come from? I've recently written a book uh, that is called uh, Heaven and Hell, A History of the Afterlife, got published just a few months ago. And it is dealing with just this question at some length. Uh, it's written for a general audience. It's not one of these books that's just for scholars. It's for a broad uh, reading audience. And it tries to explain where the ideas of heaven and hell came from. And I'm going to be summarizing many of the main, main points of this book now in my talk with you. I'm going to begin with the oldest account in the Western tradition of any kind of somebody being given a, uh, give a living person going to see what it's like in the afterlife. As it turns out, this account is found in our oldest writing of the Western tradition, the oldest story, uh, the, the writings of Homer, especially his Odyssey. Uh, this, by the way, is, uh, <laughs> this is a uh, illustration of an event that's happening in book 11 of the Odyssey, the one I'm going to talk about for a few minutes. This is Odysseus here, who has just slain a, uh, an animal in order to conjure up spirits uh, of the dead, who are here, including a prophet named Tiresias. Odysseus is on the, in the midst of a 10-year journey uh, home from the Trojan War. They've won, the Greeks have won the Trojan War. Uh, he is heading home, and he is told that he needs to go visit this prophet, Tiresias, who has died, and which means he has to go down to Hades in order to visit him to learn how he is going to return home. And so Odysseus follows his instructions and he goes there. He gets his instructions about uh, what it's going to be like going home. But in addition to that, he meets a bunch of people there. And in his meetings, we learn a good deal about what Homer and probably lots of other people in Homer's day in Greece thought life was like in the afterlife. The background is that Odysseus is going to meet these people, and what he finds there is what is called the joyless kingdom of the dead. The people who dwell in Hades, as it's called, are uh, labeled shades, which is another word for shadow. They have all the strength and vigor and life and intelligence of your shadow. <laughs> when, you, when you stand in the sun and you see your shadow, that's what it's going to be like when you die. This is true for everybody, um, according to the Odyssey. Everyone, whether they are righteous or unrighteous, whether they are, uh, whether they are good people or bad people, whether they are courageous or cowardly, uh, whether they are rich or poor, whether they are famous or unknown, it doesn't matter everybody ends up in the same place. This life is the only thing that matters because this life is the only time we're alive. When we die, we're dead. And so it's not really that there's life after death in this Greek, ancient Greek view of Homer. Uh, there's not life after death. There's really just death after death. Homer was probably writing around the 8th century uh, BCE. So the time of the earliest writings of the Hebrew Bible uh, as well. And so far as we know, this was the common view in Greece at his time that, uh, that everyone dies and they're simply dead. Odysseus finds this out in uh, some rather remarkable ways, including when he meets his own mother, whom he had not known had died. And uh, she had died actually because she was heart sick for him. And they have a conversation. 
and out of his, um, his desperate grief, he goes up to his mother to hug her. He tries three times to hug her and his arms slip right through her because she has no substance. These shades have no substance, no strength, no power, and in fact, no memory. Uh, this is, uh, so the lesson here is pretty, is pretty clear too. You don't wanna die. <laughs> Stay alive as long as you can, because after this, for all of us, it's just the existence of a shade in Hades. That of course raises a problem uh, that many thinkers had in ancient Greece and elsewhere. What about justice? I mean, if there are gods in the world, and uh, I mean, really? Like, I can be a good person and uh, maybe even suffer for it and die, and then like, I don't get rewarded? And my next door neighbor, who's a real schmuck, uh, he, he's awful. And like, he's gonna get the same treatment. I, that doesn't seem right. Eventually, Greeks started uh, thinking otherwise. They started believing in a system of justice after death. There became, became to be thought an idea of rewards and punishments after death. Virgil was a Roman author who was writing uh, centuries later. Uh, he's writing in the first century BCE, so he's writing uh, 700, years, uh, yeah, 700 years after Homer. Virgil has been uh, highly influenced by Greek thought because the Romans were <laughs> highly influenced by uh, Greek thought especially in Virgil's case, the, the thinking of Plato. Plato in his dialogues talks about in the afterlife, people being rewarded or punished depending on how they live. In Virgil's great epic, the Aeneid, which is modeled on Homer, his hero Aeneas also goes to the underworld to see what the afterlife is like. And so uh, Aeneas is on a long trip after the war at Troy, after he's Trojan, he's lost the Trojan War, and he's, so he's cast out of Troy, and he's wandering off to found the people that will later become the Romans. Aene uh, Virgil is writing an account of the, um, uh, of the, uh, uh, the founding of the Roman people. And so he's modeling his account on Homer, and so Aeneas also goes to the underworld, and it's very similar in some ways. He, he, he's led by divine advice. He goes down there. He sees a bunch of people, and for, including a parent. He tries to hug his parent three times. And makes no, his arms pass right through him. And, uh, and so this is a very similar account, but with a key difference. In Virgil's account, there are rewards and punishments. Everybody is not a shade, a shadow. People have some kind of physical existence. Some people are sent off to Tartarus, which is a place of horrible torment forever. Other people who are righteous go to Elysium, the Elysian fields, where they are rewarded forever. Here we have a system of rewards and punishments depending on how one lives one's life. This is picked up by, from Plato and the Greeks, and I'm going to be arguing it eventually is what made it into Christianity. Christianity, of course, did not arise out of Homer and Virgil directly. It arose out of the Israelite tradition. Uh, in particular, it arose out of the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew Bible, um, there are debates about whether it's been influenced by Greek thought or not. Um, uh, there are debates. For our purposes here, it doesn't matter very much. It is interesting, though, to see that in the Hebrew Bible, there is a view of death that is similar to Homer's. Um, these accounts, the Hebrew Bible accounts, started being written about the same time as Homer. And in the oldest versions of uh, the oldest parts of the Hebrew Bible, when a person dies, they are dead. There is nothing after death for most of the Hebrew Bible. When you're dead, that's the end of the story. You have no body any longer. You don't have a soul any longer. You don't exist any longer. You are simply dead. You have no memory. And in fact, you can't even worship God and God doesn't remember you. <laughs> this is, it is not a happy portrait uh, painted in most of the Hebrew Bible about what happens when you die. Again, it's not life after death, it's death after death. 
Hebrews had a very different understanding of the human person from the Greeks. Before Plato, but especially in the works of Plato, the idea was that a human being is made up of two substances, a body and a soul. When a person's body dies, the soul lives on, according to Plato. The soul is immortal, even though the body dies. That's the Greek tradition. The Hebrew tradition is very different. In the Hebrew tradition, a person is not made up of two things, body and soul. A person is one thing, a living body. When God creates Adam in the book of Genesis, he makes a, uh, a shape of the human being out of the dirt. And that's all Adam is at first. He's the dirt. He's a model. But then God breathes into him. And when God breathes into him, Adam comes to life. Life is brought by the breath. The breath in Hebrew thought is very much like what we think of as the soul. When the breath leaves the body, the person dies. They're dead. The body's dead. But the breath doesn't continue to exist. This, we agree with this. This is our view, too. When, when you stop breathing, when you die, your breath doesn't go anywhere. Well, that's what the soul is for ancient Hebrews. When there's no soul that exists after death, the soul is simply the thing that makes the body alive while it's alive. And so when you die, your breath stops, your soul, there's no soul, you're, you're dead. What about this place in the Hebrew Bible sometimes called Sheol? Uh, the word Sheol uh, is, uh, it's hard to know what the word itself actually means. There are various theories about that. The word shows up mainly in poetic books, like in the Psalms. Uh, where authors are very relieved when they are delivered from Sheol, uh, which in the Psalms means they haven't died yet, and God has kept them from dying. People don't want to go to Sheol, because in Sheol, there is only death. Uh, again, there's no worship of God. God doesn't remember a person in Sheol. There's nothing to do there. Sheol is probably, though, not a place where people gather together uh, to be like Hades in the Greek tradition, a bunch of shades getting together with nothing to do but being bored for eternity. Sheol in the Hebrew Bible appears to be a synonym for the grave or the pit. In fact, it's used synonymously with grave, pit, and death. Sheol is simply where your remains are tossed when you die. You don't exist any longer. Again, this raises a very big question about justice. Uh, if God is in charge of this world, God created this world, as is, is the case in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, if God created this world and he called us to be his people, as, as Jews thought, and then I follow God's dictates found in the law, and I'm a righteous person, and, but I have a horrible life anyway, I'm miserable, I'm sick all the time, and I, I'm oppressed, and then I die, and that's the end of the story? <laughs> no, that can't be true. And on the other hand, this person over here is the most wicked person. He's this tyrant who murders people and makes himself fabulously rich and doesn't care about, uh, about rights and about poverty. Or he just cares about himself. And you mean he's going to die and get away with that? No, that's, that can't be. Well, in the, virtually all of the Hebrew Bible, that is the case. It doesn't start changing until the very end of the Hebrew Bible with the final book of the Hebrew Bible to be written, which is the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel doesn't come last in the Bible, but it was the last of the Hebrew Bible books to be written. And it starts embracing a new way of Jewish thought that scholars have called apocalypticism. Apocalypticism is based on the word apocalypse, which means a revealing, uh, a revealing or an unveiling. Jewish apocalypticists thought that God had revealed to them the secrets that could make sense of this miserable existence we have to live out here on earth. Apocalyptic thinkers, starting with Daniel, had several points of view that came to be extremely important for the development of Christianity later. For one thing, they were dissatisfied with the Sheol idea, that you, you die and that's the end of the story and there's no justice. Well, that, that can't be right. These apocalyptic th thinkers were especially impressed by the fact that the people who were good were suffering in the world. 
I mean, it would make sense that if God was in control and you were on God's side and you knew what God wants, then God would reward you. But in fact, when you look around, it doesn't seem to be that way. The people who are righteous seem to be the ones who are suffering. And the people who are evil are the ones who are in power. I mean, who, who has the wealth and the power? Are they, are they the good people who are out to help everybody? Generally not. Uh, so what is that? Well, what it is, according to apocalyptic thinkers, uh, starting with Daniel. So about, we're, we're talking about 200 years before Jesus' ministry here. About 200 years before Jesus' ministry. They started thinking that there are forces of evil in the world that are controlling this world and making life miserable for everyone. Forces of evil have been unleashed on this world. They are opposed to God, and they're opposed to God's people, and that's why the righteous suffer. The devil is invented at this time. The idea that God has a personal enemy, the devil has demons, and there are other evil forces. Uh, they've been unleashed, and they're making life miserable, and it's only going to get worse. But God is ultimately in charge of this world, and God is going to intervene to redeem this world. God is going to intervene in history and destroy the forces of evil, and he's going to bring in a good kingdom. The kingdom we live in now is wretched and miserable. It's run by corrupt people who are making God's people suffer. But God has had enough, and he's going to intervene, and he's going to ultimately solve the problem. God is going to bring a savior from heaven or possibly a messiah here on earth who will uh, solve this problem of the forces of evil. There is a day of judgment coming. On the day of judgment, God will destroy everything that is opposed to him, and he will set up a good kingdom on earth, a kingdom of God. When God does that, God, it, it, it's not that we're going to like make the world a better place. We are not going to make the world a better place. These forces of evil are more powerful than us. Uh, we can't control it. Only God can solve the problem. He's going to solve it by a cataclysmic act in which he destroys everything against to him. And that is going to apply not only to those who are alive when it arrives, it's going to uh, apply to those who have already died. There is going to be a future resurrection of the body, according to Jewish apocalypticists. It's important to understand what this teaching is. These are Jews who do not believe there's a distinction between body and soul. They do not believe the soul lives on after death. Well, then how can there be an afterlife? The afterlife for these people is that the body comes back to life. The breath returns to the body. Everyone who has died is going to be raised from the dead when the day of judgment arrives. Those who have sided with God will be brought into this eternal kingdom here on earth. It will be here on earth. This is not that your soul goes up to heaven. There is no living up in heaven. Nobody goes up to heaven to live forever. Heaven is where God lives. People live here. God created this world. So for, he created a paradise here on earth, and he's going to bring the paradise back. And people who have sided with him are going to enter into that paradise. They're going to live in the body forever. The bodies will be perfect bodies. They will never die. They'll never get sick. They'll never get hurt. Uh, they'll never suffer. And it'll be utopian existence here on earth for everybody. What about those who are opposed to God? They're going to be raised from the dead as well, but they ain't getting into the kingdom. God is going to show them the error of their ways and judge them by wiping them out. There will be a total annihilation of sinners at the end of time, and that end of time is coming very soon. It is right around the corner. These apocalyptic thinkers were trying to encourage those who were suffering for being righteous by telling them, just hold on for a while, because soon God is going to intervene and you will be vindicated and God's paradise will arrive. Uh, and so it's going to happen very soon. That's Jewish apocalyptic thought. Scholars for over a century now have recognized that Jesus of Nazareth was an apocalypticist. This has been the view of scholars widely throughout Europe and uh, North America. 
since at least the days of Albert Schweitzer. Uh, Albert Schweitzer in 1906 wrote a very important book, The Quest of the Historical Jesus, where he argued that up to his time, after the Enlightenment up to his time, most uh, scholars about Jesus didn't understand who he really was. Uh, he was, in fact, an apocalypticist who thought that God's kingdom was soon to arrive and that people needed to repent and prepare for it. And if they did not, they would be judged. Did Jesus believe in heaven and hell? It is very difficult to know, in fact, what Jesus himself actually taught. Uh, this is a complicated topic. Um, many people think that, of course, to know what Jesus taught, you just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You've got four Gospels, and so you read them, and they tell you what he taught. Scholars since the Enlightenment have realized that it's not that simple. These Gospels that we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, actually don't claim to be written by people named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The idea that Matthew and John were two of Jesus' own disciples and that Mark was the companion of Peter, the disciple, and that Luke was the companion of the Apostle Paul, those ideas don't start appearing in Christianity till about 100 years after these books were written, that these books we have were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Scholars almost universally date these books to, six, to 45 to 60 years after Jesus' death, 40 to, 40 to 60 years after Jesus' death. The first gospel was Mark, it was probably written around the year 70. That's 40 years later. It's written in Greek. Jesus and his followers spoke Aramaic. It's not written by somebody living in the Jewish homeland, Israel. It's somebody living outside of Israel, somebody who appears not even to be a Jew, who's writing in a different language from Jesus, who certainly didn't know Jesus, who's writing what he's heard about Jesus from stories that have been oral circulation for decades. This is a big problem. And you know you have a problem when you actually look at the Gospels and you take a story in one Gospel and then compare it carefully with the story in another Gospel and you start realizing, whoa, those are different. And in a lot of the stories, they're different in ways that cannot be reconciled. This is a big problem. And so scholar, there are scholars who spend their entire lives uh, trying to reestablish the teachings of the historical Jesus. So I'm not going to go into all that, obviously. I'm not going to go into the details of all that. I am going to say, though, one of the clearest teachings on Jesus' lips, ones that virtually all scholars agree for, because of their, their critical evaluation of our sources that Jesus taught, which is that the kingdom of God is coming. This is the dominant teaching of Jesus in our three earliest gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke agree on a lot of things uh, about Jesus. They disagree on a lot of things too, but they, they agree a lot with one another. And John is very different. The Gospel of John is written much later. Uh, it is, it's a very different Gospel in a lot of ways. It's many people's favorite Gospel. Um, but it's so, so much later with so many differences that people, the scholars wonder whether you, it's actually very accurate or not when it comes to the teachings of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are pretty consistent that Jesus taught about the coming kingdom of God. The earliest recorded saying of Jesus is in Mark, earliest gospel, Mark chapter 1, verse 16, where Jesus says, the time has been fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. What does this mean? This is an apocalyptic image. The time has been fulfilled. This world is on a timeline. It's like a horizontal timeline where you've got so much time and then there's going to come a cataclysmic break when God intervenes. This world we live in now, this age now in this timeline, this world is uh, evil, controlled by the forces of evil, but there'll be an intervention, the timeline that will continue, and all will be good. That will be the kingdom of God, the kingdom that God brings. When Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, he is not talking about the place that your soul goes when you die. Jesus was a Jew. He didn't believe that souls live after the body died. Uh, this, uh, the idea of the kingdom of God is that it's a real kingdom. It's a kingdom here on earth, and God will be in charge of it. It will be a kingdom that will be a utopian existence where there's no more misery, suffering, or evil of any kind. 
those who have sided with God will enter into that kingdom. Most of Jesus' teaching is about how to enter into that kingdom. You are to live for others. God's law says you should love your neighbor as yourself, and Jesus thinks God means it. If you do that, if you really love others, taking care of others as much as you take care of yourself, you will enter the kingdom. Um, you feed yourself, you should feed others. You clothe yourself, you should clothe others. You take care of all of your needs, you should take care of the needs of others. You should care about the homeless and the hungry and the foreigner and anyone who is suffering. This is the core of Jesus teaching that there's this kingdom of God coming and you need to prepare for it. Those who do not enter the kingdom of God? Well, okay, good luck to them. <laughs> well, they're not going to have any good luck. Jesus taught they're going to be tossed into Gehenna. What's Gehenna? One problem with understanding Jesus' teachings about both uh, the kingdom of God and Gehenna is that English Bible translations can confuse you. The word Gehenna is, it actually derives from the Hebrew. It's not a Greek word, even though the New Testament is written in Greek, but it's a, it's a Hebrew word because the, the Gehenna is a place and it's first mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. The problem with English Bible translations is that a number of Bible translations translate the word Gehenna in, on Jesus' lips with the word hell. That is so wrong. <laughs> when we think of hell, we think of the place that your soul goes when your body dies and lives up in heaven, lives in heaven or goes down to hell, down to the place of suffering. Gehenna is not the place of eternal torment on Jesus' lips. Gehenna in the Old Testament is a valley outside of Jerusalem that was understood to be the most God-forsaken place on the earth because Gehenna was this valley where some uh, Israelites practiced child sacrifice, the most heinous sin against God and humanity possible. It was cursed in the Old Testament. It was cursed in Jesus' day. And Jesus tells people that if they, uh, if they disobey God, if they do things God doesn't want, they are in danger of being tossed into Gehenna. What he means is they will not get proper burial rites and their corpses will be dishonored and shamed and thrown into the most despicable place on earth. Um, ancient people almost universally desperately wanted proper burial rites. This is true in Greek circles and in Roman circles and in Jewish circles and in all, just every circle we know. Jesus is saying that if you get cast out of the kingdom of God, you will in fact uh, be in danger of being thrown into this despicable place, Gehenna, that's where your corpse will remain. You will not enter into the kingdom of God because you won't be resurrected for eternal life. And so what does Jesus teach about heaven and hell? In particular, of course, heaven for Jesus is not the place your soul goes. It's the kingdom of God. And hell, Jesus did not teach that there was a place of eternal torment. There is no hell for Jesus. What there is, is destruction. Jesus taught that those who did not enter into the kingdom of God would be destroyed. They'd be raised from the dead. They'd realize, oh my God, I really missed out on that one. And then they would be annihilated. This is the consistent teaching of Jesus throughout the gospels, at least in the sayings that we're pretty sure Jesus said. Let me give you a couple of examples. People don't notice this because they just assume Jesus is talking about hell as a place of torment. But when you actually look at what he's saying, he isn't saying that. Matthew 7, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and how hard the path that leads to life. There are few that find it. You can have eternal life. What's the option to eternal life? It is not eternal torment. It's destruction. Or the parable of the weed, six chapters later. Um, so uh, Jesus tells this parable that uh, th this fellow uh, plants his field with grass, but all these reeds, weeds grow up, and they, uh, they end up gathering the weeds, and this is what happens. Uh, they take the weeds, 
and they throw them into the furnace to burn them. <laughs> and then Jesus draws, draws the uh, lesson. Just as the weeds are gathered and consumed with fire, so it will be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all those who urge people to sin and who act lawlessly, and they will cast them into the furnace of fire. What happens to sinners at the end of time? They're destroyed by fire. When you throw a weed into the fire, it doesn't exist forever. <laughs> it's, it's burned. It's destroyed. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. That's what's going to happen to sinners. They will be destroyed. Jesus' teachings of, uh, of what happens at the judgment is found most clearly in his uh, parable of the sheep and the goats, which is in, uh, in, uh, in, Matthew, uh, in Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. Um, the, uh, it's the last judgment scene. Everybody is in front of the judge of the earth. He's come to judge the earth, uh, to destroy the forces of evil, and all the nations of earth are gathered in front of him. And uh, this, this one that Jesus calls the son of man, this judge, uh, uh, has uh, one group of people on his right. These are not just Jews, by the way, they're into all the nations of earth. Some are on his right, some are on his left. The ones on the right, he calls the sheep, and the ones on the left, he calls the goats. Um, so this king uh, who is judging um, uh, welcomes those who are on his right, the sheep. And he says to them, uh, welcome, uh, you are to come into uh, the kingdom of my father because I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was, I was in prison and you visited me. And so come, you are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you from the beginning of the world. These people enter the kingdom of God. And they're confused because they say, uh, but how did we do these things? We, you say we fed you when you were hungry and gave you water when you were thirsty. We've never even met you. We don't know who you are. And he says, in as much as you've done it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you've done it to me. If you help those in need, you are on God's side, whether you're a Jew or not, and you'll enter into the kingdom. Then he turns to the people on his left, the goats. And he says, uh, be off, you who are cursed. Go away to the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Because I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. I was in prison, you didn't visit me. And so off with you to the eternal fire. Uh, and uh, they say, well, but <laughs> what do you mean we didn't feed you? We, we don't, we've never seen you before. And Jesus says, you didn't do those who were in need. You didn't do it to me. And then he concludes by saying, these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Now, this is one of those passages that you read, and it sure sounds like he's talking about heaven and hell. <laughs> I mean, some go and are rewarded in the heavenly realm of the kingdom, and others are sent off to the eternal fire. And so that means heaven and hell, right? No. Look carefully at his uh, final words. Some go to eternal punishment. The others go to eternal life. So you've got the wicked, eternal punishment, righteous, eternal life. These are corresponding statements. You have wicked, the goats on one hand, you have the sheep on the other hand. Both go to an eternal punishment or reward. But what is the reward? The reward is life. Well, if these are to be opposites, sinners versus wicked, what is the opposite of life? It's not torture. The opposite of life is death. These people are sent off to the fires to be burned and destroyed. Jesus never talks about eternal torment. He talks about eternal fire. But the fire is eternal. Yes, the fire is eternal. But people don't live in the fire eternally. When you burn somebody at the stake, the fire continues on after the person's dead. But the person is not still in agony three weeks later or three hours later after they're dead. For Jesus, it is eternal punishment. It's an eternal punishment because it's the ultimate punishment. It's the death penalty. And it's eternal because it never ends. It will never be reversed. And so Jesus taught that there will be a kingdom of God here on earth. 
for those who are raised in the body, who will enter into a utopian existence, and there will be destruction for those who are not on God's side. Jesus did not teach that your soul would go to heaven or hell. So where did heaven and hell come from? Jesus, like other apocalypticists, thought that the end was coming soon. Jesus told his followers, some of you standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come in power. This kingdom, this paradise that's coming is going to happen before the disciples all die. That's Mark chapter 9, verse 1. Mark chapter 13, verse 30. Jesus says, truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. His disciples have asked him when the end of the world is going to come. He describes the day of judgment, and then he says, this generation won't pass away before they see it happen. It didn't come. Jesus died. His disciples died. Uh, years passed, decades passed. The end didn't come. And people ended up having to reinterpret Jesus' teachings. Jesus had agreed with apocalypticists about this horizontal dualism, a dualism between this evil age and the age to come. A dualism is, of course, two fundamental components of reality, and it's horizontal. Everything is on a kind of a timeline, this age, the age to come. This age is going to end with this cataclysmic judgment. It's going to happen very soon. What ends up happening is that it doesn't come soon, and people started reinterpreting the dualism. What they end up doing is flipping the dualism on its axis so that it's no longer a horizontal dualism, it's a vertical dualism. It is no longer about time, now, this age, then, the age to come, the kingdom of God. It's about space. It's about up and down. No longer is it the kingdom of heaven here on earth, it's the kingdom of heaven in heaven, where God dwells. No longer is it destruction here on earth, it is eternal destruction below. One thing that facilitated this shift from a horizontal dualism uh, of the body being raised from the dead for eternal life in the kingdom to a vertical dualism of the soul living to heaven and hell is that most of the people that the early Christians converted to believe in Jesus were not themselves Jewish. Starting with the Apostle Paul, the vast number of people who converted were Gentiles. They came from pagan backgrounds. They came from Greek ways of thinking. Greek ways of thinking were dominant throughout the entire Roman Empire. Greek ways of thinking going back at least to Plato, who taught that the soul is immortal. The body dies, but the soul lives on. These people who converted to Christianity naturally brought their ideas with them into Christianity. They weren't Jews. They thought that there's a difference between body and soul. And so they started thinking not like Jewish apocalypticists, but more like Plato, where you die and your soul goes one place or the other. But now it's different from Plato because your soul goes to one place or another depending on whether you have faith in Jesus and are a good person, do good deeds. If you are, you will go up. If you're not, you'll go down. But the thing about the soul is, Plato taught it was immortal. It couldn't die. That meant that if you, your soul goes up, it's going to be there forever because it can't die. But the soul of the wicked is also eternal, which means it also cannot be destroyed. It can't die. And so now the idea is it will be punished forever. And that's where you start getting eternal torment uh, with a... Uh, uh, a little picture here to uh, benefit your imagination about uh, what that might entail. And so we get the birth of heaven and hell. The birth of heaven and hell as a place that your soul go goes uh, after you die. This is a rather uncomfortable amalgam between the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of Plato. Jesus, who taught that God in the end was going to do justice, 
and Plato who taught that the soul is immortal and will survive the body. You combine those two and you get heaven and hell. This change happened some decades after Jesus' death. It happened some decades after Jesus' death. As people in that period were telling their stories about Jesus and remembering the things he said and remembering the things that he taught, they, um, uh, they naturally told what they thought Jesus taught based on what they understood about Jesus. By this time, what they understood about Jesus is that he thought there was a heaven and hell. And so some of Jesus' teachings in our later gospels from this later period seem to embrace the idea of a heaven and a hell. Um, but it's because these are not the things that Jesus actually taught. These are things that are put on his lips by later storytellers. The task of scholarship is figuring out which things Jesus really taught and which things have been put on his lips later. And so some of you are, while I've been giving this talk, you're, you're, you're going through your, uh, your little file in your head, your Rolodex file, which we never have Rolodex files anymore, but many of you will know what I mean. And you're coming up with these verses in the Bible that seem to support the idea of a heaven and hell. And there are, there are a couple, uh, such as uh, uh, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, where it appears like these, this rich man dies and goes to hell and is burning, and the poor man goes to heaven and, and, and looks, yes. Uh, and it's almost certainly something Jesus didn't teach himself. Um, I don't have time to prove that, although if somebody has a question about it, I'm happy to talk about it and explain why, but I do talk about this in my book and try to explain why it is almost certain that Jesus held the traditional Jewish view of the kingdom of heaven and uh, the destruction of sinners at the end of time. This teaching of Jesus is very different from the teaching that came down in Christianity. That will come as a surprise to many Christians today, but in fact, it's part of a larger picture. Much of the New Testament uh, records of Jesus, in fact, are later elaborations of the things that Jesus taught, uh, sometimes exaggerations, sometimes things put on his lips, sometimes things that he didn't actually do that are described in these texts. The teaching of heaven and hell uh, is one of those things. Original Christianity did not have uh, life in heaven and, li and torment in hell. What it had was a kingdom of God that was coming soon that would be a paradise here on earth. And for those who failed to meet uh, God's demands, destruction. Nowhere in the teachings of Jesus or in the Old Testament is there any teaching of eternal torment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, very much for that. We have, as you can imagine, several questions. So I did want to give um, you a chance to um, first, though, answer this. This was our first question that came in at the beginning of your lecture. And Natalie Carden asked, as a lay person, what book would you recommend she read first of those that you have written? Uh, no, it's a good question. So, um, the uh, my my most popular book, the one that sold the most, that people uh, talk to me the most about, is the one called Misquoting Jesus. Um, it's a book that uh, it deals with how Christian scribes who are copying their New Testament changed it uh, in places. So there are places where we don't know what the original writers actually said. Um, my, probably my favorite book to write for a, a general audience was this Heaven and Hell book that I just came out. It was, uh, it was a real, just for me, just endlessly fascinating uh, to write about. I, I, most of the times when I write a book for a general audience, this, this is true of most scholars, you know, when you, like if you, ha if you have somebody who's like a physicist who writes a book for a general audience, he, he's not like learning anything when, he, when he's writing the book because he's a physicist. This is what he does for a living. And so it's kind of like that when you write. But but this Heaven and Hell book, I actually learned something. I, I, I came to different views about things that I hadn't had before. My, my most um, sophisticated popular book, the one that I think that I'm most proud of as a piece of like really uh, is, is The Triumph of Christianity. So those are, yeah. So, yeah. 
So they asked for one and I gave you three. <laughs> so there you go, Natalie. You can take your pick of those three. Jordan uh, Rood asked this question and it's about Revelation. About the passage in Revelation regarding a quote, war in heaven, unquote. I believe most Christians interpret it as an origin story of Satan and the fallen angels. Mormon theology goes further with it, stating that this war was a pre-mortal battle between Jesus and Satan over agency and that everyone born on earth was there as a spirit. Can you explain to what does this passage mean to Bible scholars and how an evolving view of heaven and hell led to the modern Christian and possibly Mormon reinterpretation of this passage? So I'm, I'm not able to speak to the justification for the Mormon view because I, I'm, I'm not familiar with, with Mormon uh, understandings of the book of Revelation. Um, I will say that the book of Revelation um, has a, a really important uh, verse early on when, the, uh, when Jesus appears to John and he instructs him uh, toward the end of chapter one that he is to write the things that have been, the things that are, and the things that are to come. Chapter one, describes what has ha already happened, the vision that the person that John has had of Jesus. Chapters two and three describe the things that are. He writes, uh, the, the author writes seven letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor, and he's describing the situation in the churches now. Starting with chapter four, the rest of the book is about things that are about to, to happen, and so they're descriptions of the future. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm not going to yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not going to say anything about the particular Mormon interpretation, but I will say the Bible scholars generally understand this to be a kind of a cosmic battle that's kind of like what I was describing. Uh, the book of Revelation, the word apocalypse actually comes to us from the book of Revelation. The, Revelation is a Latin word that means a revealing, and it's the Latin translation of the word apocalypse. And so sometimes this book is called the Apocalypse of John. And it's normally understood by biblical scholars to be a, a, a kind of a, a vision of the triumph of God over the forces of evil. And this battle in heaven is usually understood as one of the elements of this, uh, this eventual uh, defeat of the powers of evil in the world. Thank you. So you um, mentioned Luke 16 in the passage there in, about the rich man and Lazarus. And we did indeed have a question about that. Did. So how do scholars, or how do you interpret Jesus' parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16? And that's from Spencer Parker. Okay, I'm going to assume that people do not necessarily know uh, the details of this. And so I'm going to, this is going to take, this is going to take a minute <laughs> because I've got to explain how this parable works. Um, Jesus in Luke 16, uh, this is found, by the way, only in Luke 16. This is the only place in the New Testament. The other gospels don't have this, don't have the story. Jesus talks about this um, uh, there is a very, very wealthy man who lives in this mansion, and he eats sumptuous meals all day long, every day, and he's dressed in these gorgeous clothes, and like he's just, he's just as rich as they can get. And outside of his gates is a man whose name, the rich man's name, uh, named Lazarus. Lazarus is dirt poor. He's starving to death. He's begging by the gates and just hoping to get some scraps from this rich man's food. And he's sick, and he's got got sores all over his body. He's so bad off the dogs are coming up and licking his sores. So, I mean, it's real contrast. They both die. The, uh, the rich man is taken down into, uh, uh, down below the earth and is tormented in fire. Lazarus is taken up to the heavenly realm to be in Abraham's bosom, Abraham the father of the Jews. So he's feasting with the patriarchs of Israel in heaven. The rich man looks up and he's down there, he's dying down. I mean, he's, he's in bad shape. He's, he can't die, he's there forever. And he, he sees Abraham and he says, Abraham, send Lazarus down. At least you could stick his finger in some water and cool my tongue. And Abraham says, no, I can't do it. There's this huge gap between us. There's this chasm and you can't go between one and the other. And so sorry, that's not gonna happen. And, and the rich man says, well, look, at least at least could you send him back to earth? Because I got these brothers. And if you would just tell, if you would just tell them what's going to happen to them, if they don't turn, turn around, if they don't repent, then, you know, so he could at least warn them. And Abraham says, this is a really important verse. And it says, Abraham, Abraham says, if they don't, they've got Moses and the prophets, they've got their Bible. If they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they aren't going to believe, even if someone is raised from the dead. 
that's a key verse. And the reason it's a key verse is because it shows that almost certainly Jesus did not tell the story because it presupposes that the audience knows somebody has been raised from the dead and people still don't believe. So this is not a story, this is, you know, at the end of my talk, I was saying, you know, there's something to appear to be put on Jesus' lips. This is one of those places. And it's, it's because of that. The, the second thing I'll say, two other things I'll say about it is that it is clearly a parable. It is not a literal description of what's happening. It, this happens in the Gospel of Luke. The, this section of the Gospel of Luke is one parable after the other. And a lot of these parables begin with exactly the same words. There is a certain man. And that's exactly how this parable starts. There was a certain man. So it's a, it's a parable, um, which means it's not a literal description of anything. The other thing to say is that there's no word about either one of these, the rich man suffering forever. He's just suffering now. And so we don't know, we don't know if it's eternal torment, even in the, in, in the parable. But I don't think it's something Jesus taught. I think it's something later got put on his lips by somebody who's trying to make this point about uh, even if somebody's raised from the dead, they're not going to be there. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> So we're going to stay uh, in the New Testament for a moment. And what is the scholarly consensus about 1 Corinthians 15, 29 regarding baptisms for the dead? Is there any evidence that early Christians actually performed baptisms for the dead? And we can thank Corinne Kralin for that question. So uh, thank um, <clears throat> I will say that when I'm uh, talking to, uh, to uh, Protestant audiences, I never get this question. <laughs> but, uh, mainline Episcopalians, Methodists, <laughs> they do not ask this question. So yeah, right, baptism for the dead, right? Uh, the reality is we don't know. Uh, we don't know what, what it's all about. Um, there, are, uh, there are dozens of theories uh, that uh, the scholars have. You know, it could well be, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, it, it could be that people are being baptized for the sake of others who have died already. Uh, we don't know what, what that would, we don't know what that would involve. Um, Paul is presupposing that this is a, whatever it is, is a practice. But, you know, it, some scholars think it doesn't mean for the physically dead, but for the spiritually dead. Um, or scholars think that it means for people who died, who were already people who have faith, who, who had come to believe in Christ but hadn't been baptized yet. Uh, and so, as I said, and the, the theories is all in my arm. But the interesting thing is that Paul presupposes that uh, it's happening. He doesn't, he doesn't approve it or disapprove it. He just it states it kind of as a fact. So he knew what it was about, and they knew what it was about. Um, and uh, the other thing is that the reason he's saying it is, uh, is the particular thing of importance for Paul. He's saying it because he's saying that if the dead are not raised in the future, then what's the point of being baptized for them? Uh, so it's only if there's a future resurrection that this matters. And so, so he's not making a point about the, about the baptism for the dead. He's making a point about the resurrection. Uh, and so, yeah. So sorry, I wish I had a definitive explanation. But I mean, I know about 20 scholars who have definitive explanations, and each one of them has a different explanation. <laughs> so, so. Sounds a lot like some participants. That's excellent. So you mentioned that the devil was invented by apocalypticists about 200 BCE. Who then was Satan in Job? Yeah, great, great question. So, um, so there's a there's a figure in the book of Job, uh, chapters uh, one and two, called Hasatan, the uh, Hebrew, the Satan. Satan in Hebrew means the uh, the adversary. Um, and so this is, uh, in, in the book of Job, this is not the devil. This is not the evil power opposed to God. What's happening is Job is the most righteous man who's ever lived, and he's got a great life as a result of it. And uh, God telling, tells the divine beings around him, the sons of God around him, the, the divine counsel around him, look at this man. He is so righteous. And then the adversary who play and plays devil advocate uh, says, well, yeah, of course he's that way because look what he's getting out of it. And so, and the, so God and the Satan, the adversary, have this conversation where God allows him to, to harm Job and to, I mean, it gets awful, as you know. Um, but this is one of God's uh, council members. 
And so God has this divine counsel around him. What ends up happening in apocalyptic thought is that this Hasatan figure becomes the enemy, not of some righteous person like Job, he becomes the enemy of God. And, um, and then you start getting the idea of the devil, and, which is a word that does not occur in the Hebrew Bible, and, uh, and demons and forces of evil. That, that happens in, around the second, you know, in, the, in the second century BCE. And now, now it's part of the evil forces that are aligned against God. So before that, you know, the Satan wasn't, wasn't the devil figure. So there's another uh, question about, uh, we'll stay with, with uh, Satan for a minute, if you don't mind, or with uh, devils. Did Zoroastrian ideas of eternal punishment and devils influence Jewish thought during and following the exile? Yeah, another great question. So um, I've changed my mind about this. This is one of the things I've changed my mind about because for years I taught that Zoroastrianism, which uh, came out of Persia, uh, had an influence on uh, Judaism because uh, uh, the, the, the land area that we would call Israel today was at, uh, was at one point conquered by the Persians. And so after the, so after the Babylonians uh, did their thing and wiped out the land, then the Persians came in, and after the Persians came the Greeks, and it kind of went like that. Um, and Zoroastrianism is this dualistic religion that comes out of Persia. So there are these two eternal forces of good and evil, and you get imagery that's very similar of light and darkness and such that you start getting in apocalyptic thought. And so the question, that Jewish apocalyptic thought, and so the question is, since Persia was there, and since this thought is dualistic, and it's got light and darkness, and it's got good and evil, and stuff, it sure, it sure sounds like maybe it came from Zoroastrianism. And so uh, I used to think so, uh, and uh, I, I taught my students that, and now I'm not sure at all. I'm really not, I'm not, I'm not positive at all. In part because um, the Zoroastrian texts that we have that embrace this view are dated centuries later. And it's hard to know whether they represent Zoroastrian views at that time. The other problem is that this seems to have crept, that the Persian influence um, ended with, you know, with the Alexander the Great uh, in 323, well, right around the, the 320s uh, in Israel. And, but you don't, don't start getting um, apocalyptic thought for another hundred years or more than hundred years. And so it doesn't look like it's being directly connected with Persia. And so, so there are these other re reasons for dating. They're kind of technical, and scholars debate back and forth. This is one of those things nobody's going to agree on. But, but I, I, I kind of doubt it now, and I certainly don't, certainly don't affirm that that's the case. So, what are your thoughts on the story of the witch of Endor raising Samuel's spirit at Saul's request, and how would it relate to your view of the ancient Jewish belief of the soul yeah. after yes. death? Thank yeah. you, Jacob Bidrain. Yeah, so uh, right, we got a, ro a lot of Rolodexes out there. They're going through their Bible. For, yeah, this is good. This is another one. <laughs> yeah, it's another one. So, yeah, yeah, so for those who are really interested, I mean, I do deal with all of these in my book because these are, ob these are kind of obvious passages you would go to. I mean, because this is, so let me tell you about the Witch of Endor story in case uh, some people may not, may not know it. So Saul is the first king uh, of united Israel. Uh, Israel had been ruled by local tribe leaders, judges for a long time, and then Saul's the first king. And uh, that's great, but he's got this personality problem, and he's always doing things wrong, and it's not going well for him. Um, he has the spiritual advisor, Samuel, after whom first and second Samuel are named. He's the last great prophet of Israel uh, up to this point, uh, and uh, the last judge of Israel, I mean, uh, and he... Um, he, uh, he's his advisor, but he's died. And uh, Saul, it, things are going very badly for the kingdom, and the neighboring armies of the, fer, fer, the uh, Philistines are gathered against them. There's going to be a battle. Looks like they're going to lose. Saul needs advice. His advisor's dead. Uh, Saul arranges for a medium to uh, bring Saul back, bring, uh, bring, Samson, bring Samuel back from the dead. And uh, She's nervous to do this because the King Saul has made this illegal by, uh, with penalty of death. Uh, and so he disguises himself, goes to this medium, convinces her to do it. She doesn't know it's him. She, uh, he wants to raise a person from this. She raises this person up and, and she realizes that the guy who made him do, do this, made her do this is Saul the king. He's just forbid that. But then Samuel comes up 
uh, it's kind of a seance thing. Samuel comes up and she recognizes him because, or Samuel, Saul recognizes him because he's, he's dressed like Samuel. He's, he's wearing his clothes and he's an old man and, and, he's, uh, and he talks with him and Samuel gives him some very bad news. He said, you shouldn't do this. You're not supposed to be consulting mediums. And he said, and the bad news is you're going to be with me tomorrow. <laughs> and so, uh, and so, so again, this sure sounds like, you know, he's going to die and his soul's going to go down to Sheol with uh, Samuel. So several things uh, to point out. The, the normal, typically Hebrew Bible scholars do not think this is talking about the soul of Samuel coming up uh, from Sheol. Sheol is not mentioned here. Samuel appears to come up out of the ground, but why out of the ground? Because that's where he's, he's in the grave. He's in a grave. That's where bodies are buried. And he doesn't come up as a spirit. He comes up as a body. He's wearing his clothes. And he's got his old, he's, he's an old man. I mean, he, so his body has been like supernaturally, this is the problem is this woman is doing what God's supposed to do, which is raise the dead. And you can't do that. You're acting like God. And so Samuel's all ticked off and we're not sure. It doesn't say why he's ticked off. He doesn't say, you know, I was having a great time down there. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you interrupted the party. I'm kind of upset about that. He, but he's, he, he just, you, you cannot use a medium and solve because you've done this. You know, you're out of here too. Uh, and so I don't think it's teaching that a soul uh, dies and goes someplace. Uh, I think it's, it is a strange story, but it, it seems to be teaching that, that the body has been reanimated the way it would be later understood to be reanimated in the resurrection. So we're going to go visit uh, Mormon theology for just a moment. To, uh, Mormonism divides heaven into three kingdoms, telestial, terrestrial, and celestial. Is there any precedent for this in early Christianity? Um, only in a roundabout way. Um, the, um, the, there were a number of ancient people, including a number of ancient Jews, who thought that there are multiple levels of heaven. Um, and so um, you have people who talk about going to the third heaven, or people going to the seventh heaven. And so um, the idea is that, so the idea, the idea goes back to, actually kind of goes back to Plato. So, in, so hundreds of years after Plato, there's a, few, a school of thought that's developed that's called middle, middle Platonism. And the idea of middle Platonism is that it isn't just that you've got kind of this material world up down here and a spiritual world up there there has to be some kind of transition between one and the other. And in Middle Platonism, the idea is that you get these layers going up from, from less material and more spiritual, but you can't get to the spiritual right away. You gotta go through these layers. And so heaven has these various layers. And when you get to the very top is where God lives. And so, uh, and so people go to diff different levels. And so you, you certainly, you do get this in the early Christian tradition, starting, starting in uh, the writings of Paul, who um, we talked about going up to the third heaven. Um, so yes, there, there is pre there's not a precedent for those names and for those precise delineations, but the idea that heaven is tiered is, is an ancient idea. So there's another question about the belief that Jesus descended into hell after his death and then came back to heaven and of course in mormonism there's a belief that jesus visited the americas so can you elaborate on those ideas in the sense that where did that idea come from that jesus went to hell so i'm writing a book that's dealing with this now actually i'm writing a, schol a scholarly book uh, that's de dealing with this um the um it, it goes all the way back to the idea that uh, if Jesus was a human, if he died, where do humans go? I mean, once you, once you have the idea, of, once the apocalyptic thing has gone away and you start having this thing of souls going to heaven or hell, then, then you know, souls go to, in Greek thinking, souls go to Hades. And so Jesus had to go to Hades. And so, okay, we'll call that hell. So Jesus had to go to hell. Then it came to be thought, well, he got raised three days later. What was he doing down there? Uh, and so they started developing their, well, they must've been preaching. He, he's probably taking his salvation down there. Uh, and so there developed these traditions that are called the harrowing of hell, where Jesus saves people who had been down there. They, they, they haven't been able to go to heaven yet because Jesus hadn't died yet. Can't go to heaven if Jesus doesn't die. Well, so where are they? They're down there in Hades, and Jesus goes and gets them out of there. 
Um, and in, in some traditions that I'm especially interested in, uh, he uh, gets everybody out. Uh, because it isn't just about him having great preaching, you know, and that he's done some nice things here for us. It's that he is so powerful, he's more powerful than the forces of evil, and nothing can stop him, and not even hell can hold him back. And so he takes everybody out, <laughs> and they go up. Uh, and so that's, you start getting the idea of uh, Christ going down to Hades uh, as soon as you have an idea of anything in Haiti. So as soon as Greek ideas start influencing Christianity, you start getting the idea of a harrowing of hell uh, not too long after that. I mean, it, it becomes first expressed in a really graphic visual way in a book called the Gospel of Nicodemus, which is in the fourth century, Gospel of Super Nicodemus in the New Testament. And you don't get the idea of Jesus coming to the Americas, of course, until, you know, so uh, your, your tradition started. Sorry. Okay. One last question, since we're getting to the end of our time. How do you reconcile Jesus' alleged statements that the kingdom of God is within you with the idea that he believed in a literal kingdom of God? Yeah. Another great question. So, um, remember that the idea that um, there's a heaven and hell, the rich man and the Lazarus thing is in Luke 16, and Luke is the only one that has this. Luke is also the only one that has this particular verse. <laughs> The verse is, uh, it's in Luke 17, and it says that uh, Je Jesus is talking to his enemies, the Pharisees, who don't believe his teaching, uh, uh, and, he, and he, they don't believe he is who he is, and they, they abuse him, and he says that if they only knew, the kingdom of God is among you, he says. So the Greek word is among you can be translated different ways, and unfortunately, in some Bible translations, it's translated within you, which means, you know, it's inside of you somehow, it's inside your body, your kingdom of God's inside your body. It absolutely does not mean that in this passage in Luke. We know it doesn't mean that for a lot of reasons, but one reason is because he's talking to his enemies, the Pharisees, and he certainly doesn't think the kingdom of God's in them. <laughs> and so, uh, but there, there, there's a whole host of reasons for thinking it. So what he's saying is that it, it's again distinctive to Luke's gospel. In Luke's gospel, the idea is that Jesus brings the manifestation of the kingdom here with us now, that in his ministry, we can see what the kingdom is like. In the kingdom, there'll be nobody who uh, has a demon in him. So Jesus casts out demons. There'll be nobody who's sick. And so Jesus heals the sick. There'll be nobody who's hungry. And so Jesus feeds the hungry. There'll be nobody who dies. And so Jesus raises the dead. Jesus enacts the kingdom in the here and now, and so it's among us. He's showing us what it's like. That, that's what it means in Luke. But, but it's, again, it's not something that Jesus himself said. Um, and even if he did say it, it wouldn't mean it's inside of you. <laughs> and so, yeah, because for Jesus, it's, it's this greater thing. Well, uh, I, I, I have one, I don't know if I'm gonna have a chance to say something, but I wanna say something. May Certainly, say please do. <laughs> I wanna tell people who are on this uh, about my blog, if we can just take 30 seconds to do that. Um, if you enjoy the kind of things I'm talking about here, uh, uh, then I talk about this stuff all the time. I have a blog. It's just called the Bart Ehrman blog. Uh, I post five times a week between 12 and 1400 words a day on everything having to do with the New Testament, historical Jesus, the Apostle Paul, books that didn't make it into the New Testament, early Christian history, up to the Emperor Constantine, women in the church, Jewish, Jude, Old Testament, Greek and Roman religion. I'm the whole, I've been doing this thing since 2012. So there are eight years. I, I have not missed a week. I've done it five times a week for every week for 12, over, for over eight years. Uh, there's a membership fee to join. Uh, it's not expensive. It's uh, $24.95 per year membership. And I give every money to chair every bit of the money to charity. I don't keep any myself. None of this money pays for the overhead for it, for any anything. All of it goes directly to charities dealing with hunger and homelessness. Uh, and so um, we uh, we will looks like we'll be raising two hundred thousand dollars this year from the blog. Uh, we uh, it's it's serious money, and I hope people can join because uh, you get tons for your money. And if you're interested in this stuff, it's like it's, like it's a no-brainer. So anyway, I, I hope people can join us. Thank you so much, not only for the brilliant lecture, but the really marvelous answers to our questions and 
with your blog for an opportunity for us to contribute to good in the world. So it has been a successful Smith Pettit lecture and we thank you so much for being our guest. And we thank all of our attendees tonight for supporting uh, Sunstone and may you have a wonderful good night.